talk about how to learn how to take off and land an aircraft. Uh, my name is Kyle Lake, as stated earlier. I'm CFI here in Humboldt, grew up here in Humboldt. Um, so the format today, we're going to just kind of keep it relatively brief. Aviation, the more you dig, the more complicated it gets, and we don't want to get into that today because we don't want to be here till the sun goes down. So uh, that being said, yes? What's a CFI? Oh, perfect, right off the bat. I love it. So certified flight instructor. Um, so that's the uh, title I have on my pilot license. Um, it's something you can get after you get your commercial license, and it just allows me to legally give training inside of an aircraft that you could use to build up time to become, a, uh, to become a pilot yourself. So that's what the CFI after my name means. Um, so uh, great leading with that. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I've been told before that aviation is kind of like talking in a second language. So if I say something, you're like, what the heck does that mean? Just raise your hand. I apologize for that in advance. Um, I don't mean to do it, uh, but you know, living in the world for so many years, you kind of start to become numb to it. Uh, I'll try to explain any terms I use, but if I say something you don't understand, I don't mind. Don't feel like you're gonna like I'm gonna be stupid if I ask. Trust me, not everyone knows what a rudder is at first. It's, it's okay. So, uh, without further ado, we'll get started. So this is the outline for today. Uh, first part we're going to talk about is how does the plane even fly? All right, besides magic, right? There's something going on there. How does it work? What are we trying to do when we're flying? Uh, after that, we're going to talk about how you control it as the pilot, exactly what do all those things and gadgets and you know, bells and whistles do. And then after that, we're going to do a step-by-step -step, uh, flight around the pattern, basically. I'm going to talk you through how you would take off the aircraft, how you would fly it, turn it around, and then come back and land. And if we have time afterwards, we'll actually demo that on the simulator over there if it's working. So any questions before we get started? Cool. All right. So a little bit about, my, uh, about myself. As I said earlier, I grew up here in Humboldt. Uh, my family's been here for a long time, a little bit too long, but I love it here. I don't plan on leaving. Um, uh, but so after high school, I was a fireman with Cal Fire for seven years. I love doing it. Um, I did three years on the Helitac program on the helicopter doing air rescue. Uh, that's my first real step in aviation. Love doing that. Love flying that, flying around in helicopters. It was a great job. I wanted to kind of start pursuing something a little more outside of the realm of firefighting, so I transferred to the air attack base here in Ronerville, here at Humboldt. And uh, there is where I met some pilots, and I first kind of started pulling their ear, like, hey, you guys have a pretty great job. You know, what do I need to do with it, kind of thing. And they told me, you know, get this, get that, do this, do that. And I took it to heart. So I started working on my private pilot license here in Humboldt, you know, on the side, not through the flight school or anything, through someone I knew, no kind of using other people's planes here and there. It took me about two years, unfortunately, because of that. If you really focus on flight, you know, flight instruction and getting it done, you could probably do it in six months if you're really determined. Um, or, you know, shorter if you have no life. So, I know people <laughs> like that. So, um, so, after about two years, I got my private pilot cert here in Humboldt, and I was sitting with them, sitting there with that, and sitting with my firefighting job, I had to make a decision. Do I continue with firefighting or do I continue with piloting? And my heart was in piloting. So last year, I made the decision to go to flight school. Went there in March of last year, 2021. Uh, went to ATP flight school down in Sacramento, Executive Airport. Was there for six months. And after those six months, I walked out the door, head on fire, and I had my instrument rating, a commercial rating, my CFI, CFII, MEI, what do these acronyms mean? I'll explain all that. So. Uh, just general knowledge, instrument allows you to fly in clouds, commercial allows you to be paid to pilot, and CFI allows you to teach people how to pilot. Those are the broad terms there. And I walked out with all of that after six months, graduated there in September of last year, and started flight instructing immediately afterwards. And then I came here to Humboldt, came back home, grew up here, wanted to come back here, and been doing it, you know, ever since. So, cool. So, how does a plane fly? Well, there's four main forces that act on every aircraft. There's something called thrust, lift, weight, and drag. And they counteract weight another. So thrust is counteracted by drag, and lift is counteracted by weight, right? So if we have an object, right, like my sunglasses here, and we just let go, it's gonna to fall to the ground because that's that weight. But you need something to counteract that force and lift. So lift is produced by the wings of the aircraft. Basically, as they move forward, 
The wind itself is generating what's called pressure zones. Really complicated stuff, not for today. Don't worry about that. But the plane pulls itself off the ground with those wings. Now, that wind, where does it come from, right? We have something called thrust, which is produced by our propeller on the nose of the aircraft. That thrust pulls us forward, but it doesn't pull us forward to light speed, right? There's something that stops us, and that's drag. So we always have those forces counteracting one another, and flying is a balance of all these forces. So if you are completely level in you know, flight, which when I say level means you're not going up or down, uh, your weight and your lift are equal, right? It's only a change of those two forces you cause an altitude change. Same thing with moving faster or slower. So if all four of those are equal, then we're going to just be flying normally. It's a lot of math. Uh, there's whole equations for it. Madness. But well, we don't care about that today. Today's simple stuff. This is fun. All right. Any questions about that? Any questions about the forces of the flight? I know it's a lot, but don't stretch your head about it. Cool? All right. So we're going to take a look inside the cockpit right now. Uh, we're going to talk about some what all these weird doohickeys do. The main ones we care about is what's called the six pack. It's a set of six instruments all set above this device right here, which is called the yoke, this thing that looks like kind of like a steering wheel. So starting with the top left, the number one right there is the airspeed indicator. So what this shows us is how fast we're going in knots, which is nautical miles per hour. Uh, slightly different than normal miles per hour. It's you know about a 1 to 1.1 ratio. It's close, but not exact. Uh, number two is the attitude indicator. This shows us our, you know, kind of how the plane is looking. It's something called, it shows pitch, which is how much our nose is up or down. It also shows our bank, which is how much we're leaning from side to side. So this device right here, those orange wings represent our aircraft. The blue represents the sky, the brown represents the ground, and are we pointing at the ground? Then we'll have this orange showing a lot of brown right here. If we're pointing towards the sky, then our orange will be over all that blue. And same thing with that roll, right? So as this orange goes further to the right, we're banking to the right. As this rolls to the left, we're banking to the left. It's like a miniature airplane. Any questions about that? Cool. Uh, to the right of there, we have an altimeter. What an altimeter does is it shows our altitude. Pretty self-explanatory, right? It shows you how high you are. Uh, below there, we have a VSI, what's called a vertical speed indicator. Vertical speed indicator shows how fast you're going up or down. So on there, there's a bunch of numbers, you know, going from 5 to 20, and then negative 5 to negative 20. And if, let's say, that gauge was on the 5, that would show that we have a climb rate of 500 feet per minute. We care about that so that we, you know, we, you can't really tell outside, like, I'm going down, but how fast am I going down? Well, that device will tell us. Uh, to the left of there, we have our directional heading indicator, which is kind of like a compass, but more reliable. So how it works is, if you can see on there, it's got all the headings of a compass, but a compass uses what, right? What, does anyone know what a compass uses? Magnetic work. Yeah, it uses magnetic poles. The problem with that is that compasses take a second. There's a delay with them, and they kind of slosh around. And you know, if you ever have a compass and you shake it, right, it's not going to read right for a few seconds. What this does is it uses a gyro, something spinning really quickly. And as we turn, it turns with us pretty quickly, so it reacts. And that's the benefit of the direction heading is that it acts like a compass, but it's not quite. The only downside is we have to set it before flight because it doesn't know what north is. We have to tell it what north is. We sit there, tell what north is, and for the rest of the flight, it'll help us tell where we're going. Uh, the last thing off to the left there is a, what's called a turn coordinator. Uh, that shows how fast we're turning. Uh, once again, it's a gyro, and it's a little more complicated when we would use that, but just know that's what it's called. Cool. Any questions? Cool. I know it's a lot. That's what you're reviewing. Okay, so we talked about, I mean, you guys are all familiar with what the, these are now, so let's talk about how you actually con uh, control the aircraft. So, in the center there, that device I said earlier is called the yoke. The yoke, think of it so similar to a steering wheel, but it doesn't have exactly the same controls. So it can turn left, it can turn right, but it also can push forward and pull back. Uh, we'll talk about how exactly that works here in a second, but just know that yoke goes forward and backwards and left to right. Then we have our throttle, which is that black handle right there. That controls our power. So as we push it in, we get more power. As we pull it out, we get less power. 
fun fact, has anyone ever heard the expression balls to the walls, like going really fast? That comes from aviation. You have a mixture and a prop handle, or a throttle handle. When you push them both forward, you get max power, balls to the walls. That's the firewall right there. That's where the expression comes from. Um, and the last thing is we got these pedals. Oh, it didn't really come out too well in the PowerPoint, unfortunately. But there's two pedals down there. Think of them, they look similar to the brake pedals, but there's one for each foot, right? Unlike a car where you have you know, your foot on the gas or the you know, brake, one foot's on each pedal. These pedals help control our aircraft's rudder, which we'll talk about here in a second. I just want to get the terminology down right there so that we're in, if there's any confusion later. Yes? Uh, where's the throttle again? Can you point oh, that it's out? A, you can't really see it that well, unfortunately, but there's a silver rod with a black handle right here. That's the throttle. So as you push it in, you gain more power, and as you pull it out, you gain less. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Is that a second throttle right there, right above? Right above? The, the red right there. No, the red right there is actually our mixture, which controls how much fuel is going into the engine. Uh, we care about that when we're lean, what's called leaning out the engine, but we don't need to worry about that today. Anything else? Cool. So, those controls affect what's called control surfaces. So, when we turn the yoke, what's happening outside the aircraft? Well, the, uh, the yoke turns what's called the ailerons, which are these on the ends of the wings. There's these rectangular squares at the edges of each wing that turn left to right or up and down, which makes us roll left to right. So as we turn the yoke, the flaps, the ailerons will move and pull the aircraft in that direction of the turn. Vice versa, if we turn to the right, we'll turn to the right. Make sense? Cool. Uh, so next one we're going to talk about is pitch control. So with our yoke, if we push it in, it controls this surface in the back called our elevator. As we push in, the elevator deflects down, which pushes our nose down. As we pull back on the yoke, the elevator deflects up, which pulls our nose up. The act of changing the angle of your nose is called pitch control. And you'll hear me say it a lot today. So pitch control is nose going up and down. Cool. And the last thing we care about are those pedals I mentioned earlier. What do they do? Well, in flight, they control the rudder, which is this surface back here behind the tail. And what that does is if we push in the right rudder, it pulls the nose to the right. If we push in the left rudder, it pulls the nose to the left, which is different from if we turn the left aileron, which rolls our aircraft, right? So the thing about flying is we have three dimensions of movement, not just two in a car. So as we roll is different from yawning. So those are the three things I want you to know today is pitch is up and down, roll is like this, and yaw is left to right. Any questions about that? Cool. Okay. So, we know how to control the aircraft now. We know some terms that I'm going to be using here in a little bit. Before we go on to the runway, let's talk about how they're even numbered. So, our runways have two ends, right? If it doesn't have another end, then we have a problem. Um, that, those numbers come from compass heads. So, if we're coming in on runway 29, we should check our compass and we should be, or in this case, 26, we should check our compass and we should be facing runway 26. That being said, the inverse of that is 180 degrees opposite of that runway. So if we're coming out on 26, what is, you know, 26 minus 18 is 8, right? Did I do the math right? No, I didn't. 26 minus 8, doesn't matter. The, yeah. You did do it. Okay, cool, perfect, awesome. Um, uh, that 26, where does that come from? Well, how many degrees are in a compass? Does anyone know? 360, right? So with aviation, when we're talking about compass heading, we usually cut off that last digit. So if we're talking about a heading of 360, we say 36. Or 260, 26. And that's where that number comes from. So a heading of 260 is runway 26. That's where those numbers you see on the runways coming in. Why do they cut off that number? Same space, same time. We know, we know what's after there, it's going to be a zero. They always round on the runways to the nearest tenth. You'll never see one that says 285. It's always a zero afterwards. So, Interesting fun fact, does anyone know if the magnetic poles move or not? They do, right, yeah. Magnetic poles move. 
So our runways actually have to get relabeled every few years. And they'll come out there and repaint them because that's no longer the magnetic heading of that runway. So, for example, Murray Field over by Eureka is currently runway 30, but it used to be runway 29. Uh, how, how, how many years did it take for that to transition? That chain, so it varies, um, depending on, because they round to the nearest tenth, and so not every runway is created equal, so it's not like, oh, today is 2020, you know, two, you know, the year 2022, change all the runways. No, it's it's more on a case-by-case -case basis. So I want to say that Murray's changed seven years ago. I, I don't... Ish. Yeah, ish. Uh, don't quote me on that, but... And prior to that, it had changed in uh, 12 or 13 years. Yes. So. The other thing about the magnetic pole, it migrates in a sort of random way. It isn't on a path like a racetrack. The pole, the north pole, the magnetic pole, the planet, it kind of goes like this. So you don't know which way it's going to go. It isn't like you're going to plan on changing the number to 3-1 later. It might go back to 2-9. It might go to 3-2. It just depends on what the magnetic pole migration does. So. Uh, uh, simple facts, not support to aviation, but it's... No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of bleed over for things that you might not think are aviation related. Weather being one of them, oh boy, weather, but we, we're not talking about that today. Um, all right, so we know how the runways are labeled, and we talked about the flight controls. Let's talk about taxiing the aircraft. So we got in our plane, we've started it up, we've done our checklist. How do we taxi? Well, we taxi with our feet. As strange as that sounds, we don't use our hands like cars. And so many students I know will get in the plane, we'll start going, and I'll tell them, all right, turn, and they'll go, okay, and then nothing will happen. Because this doesn't help. How we turn an aircraft is by using our rudders, those pedals that we stall down there. Not only are they connected to the rudder and the tail of the aircraft, but they're also connected to our nose wheel, like that. So as we push in on the right rudder, it pulls the nose wheel to the right. We push into the left, it pulls our nose wheel to the left. Now here's the issue, is that most aircraft can only turn about 10 degrees, which isn't very much, it's very mild. So what we can also use to help turn and to stop are brakes. But where are brakes, you might ask? I haven't said where brake pedals are. Well, they're actually built in to the pedals themselves. The pedals have two inputs. You push in on them, and it turns the nose wheel and the rudder, but the tips of them, the toes, if you fold them forward, actually break that side's brake. So if you push in the right pedal on the top, not in, but on the top and roll it forward, you actually break the right tire. If you push in on the left side, you'll break the left tire. If you push them in simultaneously, you'll stop the whole aircraft. So that's a tricky thing a lot of students have, is they try to correlate taxiing aircraft to driving a car. And unfortunately, it's not. Just got to use those feet. Any questions about that? It's hard sometimes for people to kind of confuse that. Yeah. So to go straight, you don't put your feet on none of the pedals? Ah, great question. So always leave your hands on the controls, even if you're not using them. But if we are going straight, yeah, theoretically, we should not have any input on any of those, on either of the rudders. Now, the planes are not perfect machines. So as you're going forward, they'll start going to the right or start going to the left, and you have to correct for it. So you're constantly doing, oh, a little bit of right rudder, oh, a little bit of left to stay straight as you're taxiing. A really good question. Um, okay, so we're taxiing, right? We know how the pedals work. We're sitting in the aircraft. Everything's going good. But we got to watch our surroundings. So airports, there's two kinds. There's towered and untowered. Towered airports are you know, the classic one where you got the dude up in the control tower and he says, all right, go this way, land here, do this. But most airports aren't. In fact, not a single airport in Humboldt County has a tower. So it's on you as the pilot to be cognizant of your surroundings while taxiing or else you can cause what's called a runway incursion and cause a collision of the aircraft. Which leads to my next point is, what does the word PIC mean, which stands for pilot in command? You as the pilot have a lot of responsibility. Everything that happens in flight is going to be on you. And so it behooves you to take it very seriously. Now, aviation is super fun, and I recommend it to anyone, but it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, anything that happens will you know, first go on to you and then you know, disseminate at some point later. But it's important that you take it very seriously while you're flying. So 
Any questions about that? Cool. Okay, so we just taxi. We got the all clear. We pull out onto the runway. We're going to take off. What do we do? So first up, full power, right? Balls to the walls. Both those full forward. Uh, you know, engine's going to start running. We're going to start going forward. We're going to use those rudders to stay in the center of the runway because we're still on the ground, right? And our control surfaces, our ailerons, our rudder, our elevator, those control surfaces I was talking about earlier, need wind. If we don't have any wind, they're not going to help us. So while we're first taking off, we're still using those rudders to help stay center line because we're using that nose wheel. Now it's very important that you don't use the brakes while on the run up or you're not, you're not going to go. Um, so another thing to consider too is when you're taking off, if you have something called a crosswind, wind blowing at an angle to you instead of just directly head on, you might have to use a little bit of controls to help keep yourself from drifting as you take off down the runway. Um, use pedals to stay center and oh, left turn says like, more right rudder. You'll hear if you ever fly with me, man, man oh man, you'll hear you'll get tired of hearing me say this. More right rudder, more right rudder. What I mean by that is more right pedal. The reason for that is a lot of single-engine, propeller-driven aircraft pull their nose to the left during takeoff. There's several forces on why this is, but just know it's there and that you'll have to counteract that. So as you take off, you'll actually have to add a little bit more and a little bit more right rudder or right pedal to help to keep the nose in center or else you'll feel yourself start to pull yourself to the left as you take off. So that's another big takeaway. So we just took off. We are you know, over Humboldt Bay, and we're all, oh shit, what do we do? Um, we're going to fly the traffic pattern, which is a traffic pattern is how you fly around an airport to come into land. So we just took off. We're climbing out. We have that full power in. What do we do next? So we have the different legs of a traffic pattern. On here, we just took off on runway 36 in this example. We're going to start turning left and enter what's called a crosswind. These are the different legs of a traffic pattern. It's very important you know their terms so that you can say it over the radio. So, for example, you know, 363 Lima Lima, turning left crosswind, would mean I just took off and I'm starting to turn left and enter my crosswind. After the crosswind, we have the downwind. And after the downwind, we have the base. After base, we have final. And I'll talk about each of those individually right now. But before that, do we have any questions about the traffic pattern? Cool. Just so you know, the reason they call it downwind is because you always want to fly into the wind. So as you're lining up to land on your runway, you're going to be flying with the wind or downstream at this point. And that's where the term downwind comes from. And if you're flying at an angle to the wind or across it, crosswind. Oh, and one more thing on there. TPA, what is TPA? That stands for traffic pattern altitude. Basically, we have a certain level that you need to stay at if you're flying around an airport. And it's important to know that so that, for one, you have a nice stabilized landing. Stabilized means you don't have to do a bunch of wild controls. And two, if other aircraft are flying overhead, you don't you know, run into them. Cool, so the first leg we just took off, we're turning to the left, is the crosswind, which, as I said, is us flying perpendicular to the headwind that's coming this way. So we just turned in, we have that crosswind. Always make sure you have that full power in. I wrote full power in here again because it's so common that students will take their hand off the throttle and you know grab two hands on the yoke. But as we're sitting there running, the throttle can start to what's called shimmy out. That's not good, right? We're flying. So you gotta keep your hand on the throttle the whole time during takeoff. It's very important. Next, we're going to pitch for an airspeed. So can anyone tell me what pitch is? You don't want to say it out loud? Up and, down. up and down, right, perfect. So, as we increase our pitch of an aircraft, we can actually slow it down, right? Because as we pitch up, we're creating a lot of drag, which slows us down, which is a counteracting force to thrust, which slows us down. We want to find a happy medium in climbing that allows us to climb efficiently, but not to you know, climb too slowly or get too slow ourselves. And we have this happy medium, so we need to find that. And it's called pitching for a certain airspeed. Most aircraft 
it, or it varies in aircraft, but the one I train in, a Cessna 172, is about 75 knots. So I'll teach my students just after takeoff, pitch for that 75. And what you'll do is you'll raise or lower the nose accordingly. If you're too slow, you've got to drop the nose a little bit. So you have to lower our aircraft's nose, drop our pitch. And if we're going too fast, you've got to increase that pitch a little bit to slow us down. Cool. So we're in the crosswind, but when do we turn for downwind? Right? You're just flying there and you're looking out the window and you see the airport on your left, but when do you turn? A good thing to aim for is 300 feet below TPA, and TPA is traffic pattern altitude. So if the airport's elevation, or sorry, if the TPA is 1,000 feet, at around 700 feet is when we'll start turning to enter that downwind. Make sense? Cool. I see a lot of head nods, I'm just making sure I'm not missing anyone that's confused right now. All right, I know it's a ton of information, but. What did you say TPA stands for again? Traffic pattern altitude. And this is the traffic pattern, but how high can we fly in it? Generally, it's 1,000 feet above the airport elevation. So the airport elevation is 100 feet. TPA will be around 1,100 feet. Pretty simple. It can vary, but that's a good rule of thumb. What's the elevation of Murray? Oh, Murray is seven feet. So. Basically sea level. Um, all right, sweet. So yeah, we're in the crosswind. Once we get 300 feet below TPA, we're gonna start turning that left and entering the downwind. The whole time, you know, we're still climbing. So we just entered the downwind. We're flying parallel to our runway, and we're just sitting there, right? Well, it's gonna take a while because we're sitting there. If you're idle in a plane, you're not doing something right. Always got something on going on. So what we're going to do is do a before landing checklist. What I teach my students is check to make sure that red handle all the way in, that mixture that you brought up earlier. Make sure your fuel selectors are on the right valve, which affects tanks and things like that. And you know, make sure that uh, what's called carb heat is on, which allows our engine to keep from icing from pouring inside our engine. So we do that checklist. We got some time, let's check the engine, let's make sure everything's gonna go good. A good judge to see how far from the runway you are is that the runway is about halfway up the wing strut. So as you can see right here, here's an example runway. Here's a wing strut. It's about halfway up in this green zone is what we want from distance to the runway as we're flying to the left in this example, right? And we look out our left window and we can judge that. And if we're too close, like the runway is really low on our wing strut, we gotta turn away from it. Or if it's really high, we're way too far. We gotta turn in. It's a good, easy judge. Um, so, we're flying along, still parallel to the runway. Once we are a beam, our touchdown point, does anyone not know what the term a beam means? I know it's kind of a weird term. A beam, perfect. So a beam means to be equal to something, right? So if we're flying along and this is our runway, I'm in my downwind right now, but I want to touch down right here at this half. At this point, I am a beam, my touchdown point, right? I'm equal with it. I'm going to start my descent at this point. How do we descend? Well, we don't just push the nose down or else we're going to get a ton of speed. So we have to do it slowly and in a controlled method. How we do that is we're going to start reducing our power. We're going to reduce our power to around 1,500 RPMs. The engine settings are uh, good to think about is this right here. It's our tachometer. It's another. It's not part of the main six pack, but all your aircraft will have it. And it shows how fast our engine's running. You have one in your car. We use these power settings to kind of determine what kind of flight attitude we want. And for descent, we want it to be around 1500, so the arrow to be right about there. And what, what that will do is it'll slow our aircraft down and we'll start to sink in a nice controlled method. Cool. So as we start descending, our airspeed is going to get lower and lower, but we want to still get slower because we're going fast right now. So we're going to start bringing in or introducing what's called flaps, which are these big panels behind each wing, which slow us down. So we're going to bring in our first 10 degrees of flaps at this point. And there it is, pitching for that airspeed again. So once again, even in descent, we can pitch for that airspeed. So if we want to descend at 75 knots, we'll pitch for that. If we're going too fast, we've got to pitch up a little more. If we're going too slow, we've got to drop the nose a little bit. Cool. All right, so we just turned in the downwind. We're turned, we are beam our touchdown point. 
we started to set, and then we turn in for base, which is that leg just before final. So a key part of base is always maintaining that airspeed, but also judging your height based on the runway. There's an expression I teach all my students, am I high, am I low, am I fast, am I slow? Um, and the purpose of this is so that, and I want you repeating it while we fly together. I want you saying that out loud so that you're looking outside off your left wing at this point, you'll see your runway, and you need to decide, do I feel like I'm too low to the ground, or do I feel like I'm too high? Do I feel like I'm going too fast right now, or am I going too slow? And acknowledging things, these things and correcting for them are key. Remember, a good pilot always adapts. Right? So if you are low, don't just, well, this is my fate, here comes the ground. No, I'm going to react and adapt and add power or pitch up if I'm too low, or if I'm too high, reduce power and decrease the angle, you know, or drop the nose. At this point, too, we're going to introduce a little more flaps. So we're going to drop the flaps a little bit more. These degrees, by the way, is just the angle that the flaps come down. So 10 degrees is super mild, 20, and 30. And 30 is the maximum. 30, it's just a lot. It's like putting on big air brakes. Uh, so yeah, that's the base. And then we're going to start turning in for final. So on final, we're going to slow ourselves down a little more. So this whole time while we're descending, we've been around 75 knots. This has been fine, but we want to get even slower because we want to bleed off all our airspeed before we go onto the ground. So as we line up on final, which we'll see this perspective right here, we're going to start adjusting our power based on our glide. So we're going to see the runway, we're going to pitch for that airspeed, but if we feel like we're going to be too high, we might reduce some power, or if we feel like we're going to be too low, we're going to add some power. Good thing to think, a uh, good rule to live by is pitch for that airspeed, but use that power for that runway. Does that make sense, everyone? I'll say it again. Pitch for your airspeed, power for the runway. If you pitch for 65 and you're too high, what are you going to do? You're going to reduce that power. Or if you pitch for that 65 and you're like, oh, here comes the ground, you're going to add some power. As you do that, as you change that power input, you're going to actually have to change your pitch as well, because you're all of a sudden, if you have, you're going too low and you add some power, now all of a sudden you're going too fast. So you've got to raise that nose up and find that 65 knots again. While on final as well, we're going to bring on our last degree of flap, going all the way to 30. Uh, small corrections have big effects. What I mean by that is, as we're coming in and we're making all these corrections for wind and things like that, if you're, whoa, whoa, doing this and up and down and left and right, the plane is going to react like that. We don't want that. Small correction. So if you feel yourself drifting to the left, a little bit to the right. And as you make that small correction, the plane will react. It'll be delayed, but it'll come to you. Small corrections have big effects. All right, I have a video. I'm going to present right here. Let me know if you can't hear this in the back. Clearly. Here's a proper landing from outside the airplane. As the airplane gets 10 to 20 feet above the runway, the nose is raised to begin the landing flare. The rate of descent is noticeably reduced, and the pilot lets the airplane slowly get closer to the runway. The nose keeps coming up as the airplane flies about a foot or so above the runway. Finally, the airplane touches down on the main gear with the nose wheel well above the runway. Now here's the same thing from a pilot's perspective. The flare, or roundup, should be started about 10 to 20 feet above the runway. As you approach the runway and begin to slow by increasing the pitch of the nose, start to reduce engine power. As the airplane slows, shorten your focus to the point where objects are clear. In the beginning of the flare, you are trading airspeed for altitude in the form of a lower rate of descent. It's not an even swap, because drag always takes a commission on these transactions. By increasing the pitch attitude, the descent is slowed so that you can let the airplane slowly settle to about a foot above the runway. The pitch attitude which stops the descent will not keep the airplane there, so back pressure must be continually increased until there is no more airspeed to trade. At this point, the airplane wings stall, and the airplane settles to the ground. Ideally, this occurs at the same time that full back elevator control is reached. The nose wheel should gradually settle to the runway. So, what that he's referring to is 
the flare and ground out. So this is the final stage. So we were on final, we're coming into land, we're really close to the runway, about 15 feet. What do you do, right? You keep going like this, you're gonna crash right into the ground. So what we do is what's the flare and the round out. So as we get within that 10 to 15 feet, we're reducing our power to idle. Uh, we're gonna keep going at our aiming point, but we're slowly gonna start bringing up the nose. And what this does is as we know, as we increase pitch, what happens to our airspeed, right? It gets low, right? We increase our drag and we slow down. And we wanna slow down right now. Because if we just go straight into the ground, we'll carry all that speed with us and we'll bounce and you'll balloon and you'll porpoise and you'll start doing this and eventually the aircraft will break. We don't want that. So we wanna make sure that we land with as minimal power as possible. So we're gonna slowly start to raise that nose up. We already took that power out. So what we're doing is what's called bleeding off airspeed. We're slowing ourselves down, we're bleeding it, right? We're losing it, we don't have it anymore. And we want that. You're gonna get closer and closer to the ground, raise that nose up, and you're gonna enter what's called ground effect. Ground effect is about a wingspan distance from your aircraft to the ground. And what it means is that your aircraft flies easier in ground effect. It's, without getting into the mathematics of it, there's less drag. And so our aircraft will actually fly faster, which is not good, right? Because we want to slow down. So we have to just maintain that ground effect as we bleed off that airspeed. Eventually the airspeed will bleed off, right? Because we're not producing any more power. We'll start to sink. You're going to raise the nose up a little bit more. What we have are the main tires here. You want to set down on the mains and slowly reduce the angle of attack as you hit the ground to drop the nose on the ground in controlled method. The goal is that our main tires touch simultaneously when our wings stop producing lift. So as we get slower and slower and slower, the main tires touch and all of a sudden the plane can't fly anymore. That way when we do hit, we don't bounce off the ground and start flying because the wings can't. They don't have any more energy left. Cool. All right, and then braking. So we just settled down, we just landed on the runway. We're gonna, we're, we still have those control inputs in. Never stop flying the aircraft. A lot of students, they get on the ground, all of a sudden they just go dead on the controls. Like, I did it. Well, you're not done yet. So we have to still use those yo know, yoke to counteract wind. And all of a sudden now we're using those rudders, not only to control the yaw of the aircraft, but also now that nose wheel comes into play again. We wanna maintain that center line, keep us right there in the center. And as we start slowing down, start braking. Just gently, right? If you just do this, we'll fly forward, which we don't want. So slowly introduce that braking. What you can do is pulling back on the yoke, which makes us go up, but we have no, you know, we have no lift left. But what it does is it puts a lot of weight on the main gear, right? These right here, this one and then the other side, puts more weight on the main gear, which allows us to brake even faster. And it keeps us from toppling over if we brake too much. So we're gonna slowly start reducing that, braking and slowing down, and then taxi off the runway. So, when you're all done, it should look like this. Well, not, not that, not quite, almost. Uh, there we go, like that. So it should look like that um, when you're all done, and if everything's good, uh, you just you know took off and landed in the aircraft. So. Any questions? This is the time, this is the end of the PowerPoint, so. Um, yeah. On the slide that was for the final landing, Yeah. there were, indicators on the left side of the runway. Ah, yes. Yeah, so that is what's called a visual glide slope indicator. What it tells you is based on the colored lights, if you're too low or if you're too high, ideally, we want to see two white and two red. If you see more than two red, if you see three or four, you're too low. If you see more than two white, three or four, you're too high. White is high, red is dead, is how we remember it. So ideally, when you're coming in, two red, two white. Cool. Any other questions? Sweet. All right. I'm um, super glad you guys all understood that flawlessly. So that's impressive. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. So somebody must have a question. I love talking about this, so I don't mind. Yeah. Can you pitch up too much and, like, hit the tail or something? Ah, yes, you can. Uh, so when you're coming to land, it's a delicate balance because you can, what's called tail strike, the aircraft. If you're coming in and you flare or pitch up too much, that tail will hit. So yes, we, you know, we mitigate that by, you know, we're always watching that nose the whole time and, you know, judging it based on our descent. And also, if you flare too much, you'll actually take back off. You'll bleed off all that airspeed 
And all of a sudden, now you have no air speed, and it'll actually stall up and come back down to the ground, too. So it's all, it's just all bad. Never just pull back super hard. Yes? Uh, how much gasoline is in the aircraft? Oh, great question. Uh, so it depends on the aircraft. Uh, my, the aircraft that I've been using for today's example is a Skyhawk 172. Uh, usually, it has around 24 gallons in each wing for about a total of 48 which the aircraft burns around eight gallons an hour. So, you know, you can do the math. Just over four hours of flight usually is what we usually estimate it for. Yeah. Uh, the air traffic pattern? Yes. Does it depend on the way the wind is blowing that given day? Ah, excellent. Yes. So I wanted to, I wasn't going to introduce that necessarily so we didn't start talking about radio traffic and things like that. But it is determined, right? So as I said earlier, we always want to land into a headwind. Well, winds don't always blow the same way. So we have, we default to whatever runway the winds are currently blowing closest to, right? So if, even if the winds are blowing at a heading of 300, 300 degrees, but the runway heading is 34, we're going to land on 34 instead of runway, you know, whether it be 1, 2 or something like that. We don't want that or else we're going to be landing with a tailwind. So we're going to always try to land with the wind. And that's at an untowered airport. If you're at a towered airport, they'll tell you, land on this runway make do with what they did, kind of thing. And they'll, they'll obviously try to do it with the wind as well, but cool. I love talking about this. So, um, you know, I've been flight instructing here in Humboldt since November, and I just, it's a great job, and I love aviation. So please, please, please talk to me about it. Don't ever feel like you're in, you know, a hassle or anything. Yes? You can maybe just uh, briefly um, talk about what the experience is like, maybe from our standpoint of folks that are interested in getting to where you're at and like how the experience was for you a little bit? Absolutely. Do you want to, so do you want to hear about the whole process of my pilot school or just the private stage? What would, what would you know, that's up to you guys. That's, how much time do you have, you know? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, I have questions about the difference in going to, like, it's all you went to ATP yeah. rather than private and you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go about getting a private license. Let's, let's define what ATP is, because some okay. people don't know what that is. Okay. More of that direct flight program. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that right now. So ATP is a, uh, it's a flight school. Uh, it's a, now, not to be confused with the pilot license of an ATP level license, this is one of the brilliant marketing behind ATP flight schools that they name themselves after an already existing license, it means two different things. So ATP flight school stands for Airline Training Program. Uh, they're the largest flight school in the United States. They have, I don't know how many it was. I think it was like 50 something when I started, but I'm pretty sure it's 70 now. Um, you know, locations everywhere, very streamlined. So you can go in there, zero time, just as you are now, hey, I want to be a pilot. And you'll be like, all right, cool, can you start tomorrow? And you will go through their program and you'll walk out with everything I did. You can also come in there already with your private license, like I already had, and start there and the, start with your insurance stage. Now, there's pros and cons to both. So if you want to work on your private locally, for example, which I would encourage, it will be a lot more laid back in both a good and negative way. You'll have be able to probably work on your own, go to school, do other things. If you go to a flight school like ATP, that is your life. You'll do nothing else seven days a week, that flight school. Um, it's an extremely accelerated program. If you come in there with nothing, you'll walk out the other end in about nine months, if you're fast. Um, and it takes a lot of time and commitment. I was there seven days a week, um, studying, taking tests, or flying every day. Um, I didn't have a life. Uh, and it was just me and my you know, other students, so. Yes? Are there loans and grants available? Yes, there are. Yeah, so there are. I took out a student loan to go to flight school. Even for private licenses? Uh, so it depends. Uh, my fl the flight school I went through had a partnership with Sally Mae. Uh, that's what I did for my student loan. Um, if you wanted to get your private here in Humboldt, for example, uh, there's not a like a flight school that does that. So you have to you have to be like a private loan. Like what recommendations do you have with like specific air airlines? Like I know Delta, American. I think all three United all have their own like. Aviation programs, so it's like, what's like your take on that? Is it more of like that direct thing, kind of like flight training with ATP, or is it more? You know what? That those are great programs if you want to be an airline pilot. If you want to be a, so, they just uh, previously, you know, United did not have its own flight school. 
they had a aviators program, which is where you could sign up as you are and join it, go through any flight school, and or accredited flight school, I should say, you can't just do it like a mom and pop somewhere, but accredited flight school, and when you walk out the other end, you basically sign a contract, once you get your flight hours, I will work for you, and they'll put you down and you'll, your seniority will start then, which is a big leg up in the airline industry because everything's based on seniority. But December of last year, so you know, three months ago, four months ago, United opened up its own flight school, the Aviate Flight Academy in Arizona. That is a flight school completely for and by United. And if you work there as a flight instructor, you actually become an employee of United you're, you get all the flight benefits and your seniority number starts. Those programs, if, if that's your dream, I would recommend it. That is not mine personally. I'm not you know, interested in the airline world. So I can't exactly recommend it. I can't be like, oh, do Delta. I, I have no dog in that fight, unfortunately. But Yes? Uh, how much would it cost to do this whole entire um, thing? Yeah, absolutely. That's the a, that's a golden ticket question, isn't it? Um, so, it, I can only tell you what ATP costs. I don't know what the other airlines offer. Um, are you looking at the full shebang, or are you looking at just to get your private license? Uh, private license? Just the private? I mean, how much would you say to set aside if you were going to do that? When people ask me, I say put $8,000 in the bank someplace, and when you have $0,000, you're really close to getting your private pilot's license. It, it varies entirely, and, it, and uh, using a simulator like what we're going to walk over and look at after we're done here has a major impact on your progression to flying, uh, uh, flying getting a pilot's license. So essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to convince uh, a CFI that you will be safe in the airplane. But as soon as the CFI feels like you're going to be safe in the airplane, they'll let you go to the next step, which is to take a practical test. Of course, you've done all of the ground school, all of the knowledge instruction, but the big part, the goal is to sit for a practical exam with an examiner, whether you go fly in an airplane, if you do all the flying, he looks at you or she looks at you and watches you fly. So to get to that point, about $8,000. The price of gas is changing. It could be a lot more in a few months. But uh, that's a good number to shoot at. Thank you for third on it. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Sweet. Let's take a look at the simulator then. Yeah. So you're all welcome to join us over at the sim, which is in the back. And uh, somebody who wants to sit and get a little primary flight instruction with, with the CFI can uh, take a short lesson about how to fly around the airport. Thank you all. Let's do this one more time. Good. There it is. Perfect. We're looking great. So let's start turning to the right. right now.